Hello, everyone. Um, it's a thrill to be with you yet again. Um, so if you haven't heard it yet or heard it yet, I'm Angie Manfredi. I'm the Youth Services Consultant for the State Library of Iowa. Um, and this is Books with Pictures, um, the evocatively named uh, session about uh, graphic novels. So um, I, first of all, I want to start everything with the same thing I've been saying all day, which is I am so, so grateful to all of you for um, adapting and rolling with the punches and being here with us today. Um, I can't describe to you what an effort it's been, and yet I hope that all of you are finding moments of community and focus in what we're doing here today and not taking it on as like a pressure, but instead viewing it as a chance to connect with one another. Um, and I... I don't know what the future looks like, but I know that we together will get through hard things and come out on the other side um, as Iowa's library is stronger than ever. So thank you all for joining us and thank you for this. So um, I'm gonna work on keeping an eye on the chat. I wanna say that first, but it's gonna be difficult. So if you have a bunch of questions, kind of save them till the end when we get to the Q&A period, although I'm gonna work on looking at the chat and so is Sam. Um, the other follow-up is if this is the last session you're attending, please fill out the survey. That's how you'll get your CE certificate, but don't fill out the survey until you've attended every session. So if you're going all the way through till tomorrow to the last session, you can do the, um, the survey after that. And also I know we wanted to address at the beginning that the governor has issued issued that libraries need to close. She issued that today in her um, 11 o'clock statement and the State Library is working on a, um, a statement for libraries that we hope we'll have out later today. Um, and Sam, do I have anything else? Not that I can think of. Okay, let's do this thing. Oh, I should have mentioned this before when I was the host last time, in case you haven't heard this, and I did kind of mention it briefly. Um, all, of the li all of these presentations will be um, recorded unless it says otherwise on the website. So if it says on the schedule not recorded, it's not being recorded. Otherwise, they're gonna be recorded and posted on the site, including um, all of the slide decks. So if you see a slide deck, including this one, which is gonna have links in it, um, it will be posted at the State Library site, um, including any handouts and any presentations. Um, so uh, I again, I'm seeing questions in the chat about what you can and cannot still do. We're trying to get clarification from that on the governor. We just don't know at this time. Um, but the State Library is trying to get clarification as soon as we have that, hopefully we'll be able to pass that on. So that's kind of what we, and we will keep you updated throughout the day as we hear updates. So um, that's what we've heard from there. So um, I do want to start with, um, uh, you've heard me say this before, and I, so it's my message again. I want to tell everybody, please hang in there. I know that these are hard, hard times. Believe me, I feel it too. Um, it, it's overwhelming. I, I just, I've been describing this, and everybody is overwhelming. Um, this is a picture of my husband on the deck of our condo where we are currently renting, and we are very blessed to have a rooftop. <laughs> um, and so we go up there every day and yesterday it was sunny and beautiful as opposed to today where it is gray and rainy and you can see the capital off in the distance if you look over there in the left corner you can see the capital um and so i just this was a reminder yesterday when i was feeling like so in a dark place i thought you know i'm grateful for i'm going to be grateful today for the sun and for having a place that we can go outside on the top of this deck and for being with someone that i love so i hope that you are able to find these moments as well and I, I just want you to hang in there and remember that we are here to help each other and we are here to help you. So, um, and this is my contact information. Please reach out. Um, my phone is on do not disturb today, but otherwise um, I'm almost always, I'm, we're at our computers and I can answer my phone through the computer. So please reach out if you have questions about anything. Maybe not today since we're in the middle of all this, but otherwise, and you'll see my contact slide again at the end. So here's our why graphic novels. Um, this is our agenda. You always know I like to include an agenda for those of you that have been to my presentations before, but I hate the word agenda. So I always say what we're up to, what we're up to. So what we're up to today, we're gonna talk about why graphic novels, why briefly we're gonna talk about that. Um, and then we're really gonna look at how they can work at your library. And we're gonna spend the majority of the time doing the thing that I love best for those of you that have been to my online presentations, we're gonna do the thing that I love best, which is talking about um, 
titles. I'm going to recommend some titles. I hope a bunch of them will be new to you. I hope some of them will inspire you to do some collection development while you're working at home, or they'll give you ideas for the blessed moment when we get back into our libraries and you're able to start that collection development up again. Um, and then I'm going to give you a link to some resources, which again, I hope um, will give you some ideas of some ways you can continue your professional development and keep learning and um, adding things on uh, while you're if you are working from home. And also because I always love sharing resources. So that's kind of our agenda for today. So, real books. The phrase I hate most in the English language. Now, one of the phrases I hate most in the English language. Real books. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard multiple times. Um, no, uh, we don't, uh, from parents, from teachers, uh, maybe even in the back of your own head. Um, it was a thing that you, when this, when this really started to happen, you had to deal with on your own about what is, um, are, are comic books, is manga, are graphic novels, are those real books? Um, so the first thing is graphic novels are real books. Now, wherever you are right now, I want us all to take a moment to say that out loud. You have to practice saying it so that it is so familiar to you. You can say it like, boom, it happens and you just say it, you just say it. So I want you to just say it. I can't hear you, but I want you to say out loud, graphic novels are real books. That was great, I felt it, I felt it. I felt like everybody's saying that. Um, so they are real books. And here are some of the things that we know. So, so one of the things that we know, um, that we know is, we know that graphic novels have the number one thing that make kids lifelong readers, which is they build motivation. So I say this all the time, you cannot become a lifelong reader. You will not become a lifelong reader unless you are motivated to read. You can't bribe kids into it. Many of you have heard me say this a million times. Um, they build motivation because they're things that kids want to read. And when they, when that motivation builds, it's, it's what helps them become a lifelong reader. Every study that we've done shows that. So anything, anything, if you were at Don Tate's um, keynote this morning, I'm sure all of you, when he was talking about how he only wanted to read encyclopedias and he only wanted to read like medical journals, that made him a reader, right? We, we count all of that, right? They build motivation and the motivation, the intrinsic motivation to become a lifelong reader, it can only come from children selecting what they want to read. We also know from studies that they develop different literacies, um, verbal and visual literacy. We know that reading in panels, we know that reading a combination of text and words together um, is actually really good for your brain. Um, we know that it makes your brain make connections easier. Um, and we also know um, that it is a way that what we can call emergent readers, um, which is what we used to call struggling readers, but I hate that term because um, I don't like to think that anybody is struggling with reading. I think that just like I, kids who say I don't like to read, I, you just haven't found the right book, right? So it helps our emergent readers, right? So um, that as well. And we see now, and um, we have always seen, but we particularly see now more than any other era in our practice that graphic novels have literary merit as well as artistic value. So again, uh, to go back to Don's speech in this morning, um, kids who love to draw, kids who love to create, kids who love to build. There's so many connections here that happen like this. Um, and as forever, um, my repeated point over and over again, there is no such thing as a real book. That's a made up term. <laughs> right? There, there, there's nothing that's one book is real and one book is unreal. There's no such thing as a real book because they're all real books. <laughs> so that term itself is, is a misnomer. It doesn't exist. Um, there is no such place, right, as they say. So those are some of the things to keep in mind. Those are talking points that you should be familiar with. Um, those, that's research that you should know more about and that you should be prepared to enter into conversations and to promote with. And as an example, <laughs> Uh, you, are, you already are having so much great conversation about this in the chat, like I love it. Um, but these are some questions I thought we could kind of weigh in on um, about do you have graphic novels? What are your collections like? Um, what are some of the challenges you face in building your collection? They could be anything, it could be budget, it could be they fall apart too easily, it could be I don't have the space from. Um, I don't know what are your, I don't, oh, what are your successes? Yeah, it looks like what are your suck? 
Um, but that's because I was cutting and pasting. That's supposed to be what are your successes. So I just like it, if we could have a minute or two to talk about that. I'll, and I will definitely fix that. And also I'm obsessed with what are your sex. Okay. Um, it's hard to know what to buy. Okay, good news. That's what this presentation is to help you with. Um, yes, uh, at the library that I used to work at, they gave them one day to come in and check out like as much as they could before the closure in New Mexico. And my old coworker sent me a picture and there was literally like one graphic novel left on the shelf. They had literally just, they, the kids came in and they checked out like every graphic novel at the library. <laughs> so um, they fall over on the shelves. Yes, the format is tricky. Um, where do you begin? That's a great question. So um, what are your successes? So Big Nate, yes. Why are they bound? Are they bound with like spit? Um, like why? Uh, finding more for beginning readers. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, pulling them out of Dewey. Yeah, I agree. We're going to talk about that too. I think that if you have not pulled the collection out to create their own collection, that's, that's an important thing. Um, I've had great success in having convos with caregivers about comic research and value when they question or push back, which has led to some other caregivers telling about the research. Some of you might remember last year I shared this really great graphic one of my friends who's a librarian in South Carolina made about the value of graphic novels. I've seen it hanging up in so many of your libraries. I love it. Um, so Tyler says, when I started at my library two years ago, we had one shelf. Now we have a section for juniors and young adults, and it is the highest circulating section in the library, even more than the DVDs. I agree. Um, when I started working at the library in Los Alamos, I added graphic novels, and they, we, the circulation literally doubled for the children's collection in one year. So Dogman, Witch Boy, Five Worlds, Raina Telgemeier, a lot of classics. Um, we shelved them across from our early chapters so that young audiences who are just starting to get comfortable reading alone, we're going to talk about that too, Laura. Um, um, and Sam, I'm sorry, I didn't get your answer on this. Are we going to have the chat available um, after the sessions? I'm sorry, I didn't hear, I didn't get your answer for that before lunch. So, um, I had not planned on posting the chat, but with something like this that has such great chatter, um, I'll make note of that and I can pull out this section if you think it would be helpful. I do, and somebody asked it in the homeschool session too. So should we be recording the chats? I, we didn't really discuss that, but. Zoom automatically saves a copy of the chat transcript. Okay, um, that's, so what told, that's what I told That's what I told Eunice. I can get it from them. Okay, okay, so yes. Uh, there's so much good stuff going on in the chat, and if you're in another session and there's great stuff going on in the chat, we'll mind that too. Yes, also, so Andy mentioned Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck. One of the most popular comics at the library I worked at last was Peanuts, um, the Peanuts collection. The, the kids loved Charlie Brown as much as they loved Calvin and Hobbes, and there was one that was like the collected Peanuts strip from 1956, and one time a kid asked me, does this mean that this is volume 1,956? And I said, it means it's from the year 1956. And the kids said to me, did they have comics in 1956? They sure did. They sure did, champ. But that kind of, that is also the history of comics in the reading lives of children. That's how far back it goes. So um, Garfield, yeah. Yeah, one time I heard a kid, and I heard a kid crying in the stacks, and I went out to look, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be a great moment. I'm going to, like, interact with this kid, and they're going to be crying, and I'm going to, like, connect with them, and I'm going to change their life. And they were crying because they were laughing so hard from the Garfield comics that they were literally sobbing. So, um, <laughs> so all that having been said, please continue to have conversation. As you know, I think that you are each other's greatest supports and learning. So please continue to talk in the chat, talk about what's popular, talk about problems you might have, and other people might come up with suggestions. And so here we go. Um, great conversation. Love it. So. Now, my favorite part, let's build a collection for everyone. It is my favorite part for those of you that know me. The books are my favorite part. So I, I'm going to back up. What we're going to be talking about here, there is no possible way. There is no possible way I could cover everything I wanted to cover, even if I did this for the next two days. Because one of the things we're seeing across the board is that every publisher has realized that this is a market for which kid readers and teen readers are in Satiable. And so they are all bulking up their publication of high quality graphic novels. And that's the best news that's ever happened. But it also means that we can't talk about everything we want to talk about. 
So what I'm doing instead is I'm showing you a highlight of some of newer, and hopefully you haven't heard of all of them, although I'm sure you've heard of some of them, newer or unheard titles that I think can fulfill specific needs in your libraries and your communities. We're going to be looking at things for 0 to 18, all ages, and I'm also going to give you some tips on if you want to hear more about this kind or if you want to know more about this. This is the publisher to check out. This is the read alike for. So that's what we're going to be covering in this part. Are you ready? Everybody's ready. I can feel it. So this, first of all, if you are not familiar with the publisher, Toon Books, T-O-O-N, Toon Books. If you're not familiar with that publisher and you are looking for graphic novels for the K to third grade set, they are, in my opinion, the absolute best publisher for that material. This is one of their new titer, titles. Um, it is by the internationally known um, comic artist Liniers. Who, and it's also been published simultaneously in Spanish. Um, he is one of, in my opinion, one of the greatest writers for this age group working. Um, and this is a title, The Big Wet Balloon. Um, but he has several others. And this is about two sisters and a red balloon and a rainy day. It's beautiful. It's simple. It's amazing. Um, and if everything about it, I think, I'm, I'm amazed at the style of writing and how much he gets across. And this, I think, all the time, if you were looking for something to explain to someone um, how art and story come together, you, Linear's books are so amazing for that. Um, and Toon Books was founded by two longtime comic professionals, um, one of whom is the wife of Art Spiegelman, uh, who wrote Mouse. And it is dedicated to the idea that um, if kids get exposed to comics, really early on, like when they're also simultaneously reading picture books, they become comic readers for life and they become readers for life. So if, if you are interested in anything for this age group, Toon Books is the way to go. Um, and when you go there, you will see a lot of titles that you might already be familiar with. And um, I, I, everything by Liniers, I think, is exemplary. This is a new one, but it's only one selection from Toon Books. So their publisher will well worth checking out. Another one. <laughs> this makes me laugh even thinking about it. I hope that some of you are familiar with this title. This is Hippopotamister. <laughs> and it's about a hippopotamus who leaves the zoo and decides <laughs> to pretend to be a person and take on different jobs. It's by John Patrick Green. It's super funny. Um, I laughed out loud when I was reading it. You can see the hats on the cover represent some of the jobs that he's doing when he goes out into the real world. And this is another one that I think is, it, it's super cute and it also has a really level of humor that works on a variety of levels. So on one level, it's funny to think about a hippopotamus being a chef, but then it's also about what is work and how are we useful. And that's another thing I think comic books and graphic novels and manga do really well. They work on multiple levels so that's one of the ways they engage multiple readers. So um, John Patrick Green is another person who I think is really great in this field. And I, this one just cracks me up. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this book, but if you're not, it's one of my favorites. I'm sure many of you recognize these friends. So this is Narwhal um, and Jelly. This is the first book in their four book series, um, Narwhal, Unicorn of the Sea. Um, and it is about two friends who are very opposite, Narwhal and Jelly who is a jellyfish, get it, Norwell and Jelly, um, and the adventures that they have. Um, there's four books in this series so far, and one of the things I want you to notice on the front is that medal. So that medal is the Will Eisner Award, and it's given to, um, it's given every year at Comic-Con, and it's for, the out, they have a huge variety of them, like best colorist and best fan work, and uh, in the past couple of years, they've added one for materials for children ages five to seven. Um, and that's because this is a really developing field. And Narwhal, Unicorn of the Sea, won that the year it came out. Um, I, I agree. Mandy says these are her daughter's favorite. You could read them a hundred times. Um, and they're just really cute. And it's always frustrating. There's only four of them. Um, so this is another one. Super fast, super great reads. And it goes well with this other title about two friends, um, Tiger versus Nightmare by Emily Tetri. This is another one. This is about a tiger who is best, uh, a tiger who's best friends um, with uh, uh, the monster under their bed. <laughs> and it's about what happens at night. Um, not the monster would ever scare a tiger, but what do they do under the bed? Um, and one of the things I hope you'll notice on this book is the metal. 
and the medal is the Theodore Seuss Geisel Award, um, which, as you may know, is given to an outstanding early reader. We sometimes jokingly say that this award should be called the Mo Willems Award because he's won it so many times. <laughs> Um, but it's no, uh, so these, the Geisel Award is given to books for um, uh, what we call early easy readers. And Tiger vs. Nightmare is a graphic novel, but it won a Geisel honor. And that's because, as some of you have picked up in the chat, and one of the things I want you to keep in mind when you're thinking about graphic novels for this age range is, Graphic novels are not that far away from some of our easy readers. Um, when you look at the Elephant and Piggy books, when you look at another one of my all-time favorites, if you're not familiar with this series, Duck Duck Porcupine by Selena Yu, um, they're very similar to graphic novels. And they make great bridges for readers who are ready for more after easy readers, but they're not quite ready or they're not even interested yet in transitioning to chapter books. Um, and many beloved easy readers prepare kids for that format. Um, the dialogue, the way the panels move, um, they, they gateway them into these. And in fact, many early comic books are in fact readers. So I think that one of the things that I often would discuss with parents who were reluctant, I would explain to them that it's, it's not just they're going to transition out of it, but they're already used to understanding kids who love books. They're already used to understanding the way that text interacts with pictures, especially with the readers that are most popular right now. So the readers that are most popular really resemble graphic novels and some graphic novels are what we would have five years ago or 10 years ago considered early readers. When you look at Narwhal and Jelly, it's on the border of what you might, some people might look at that and be like, this isn't a graphic novel, this is a reader. So they're right on that border. And what we know as librarians is books that are on the border make bridges, right? And what we also know as people who live in Iowa is that bridges make connections and those connections are what make lifelong readers. So that's kind of why we started with some of those. And if you're familiar with those first set of titles, you might say to yourself, I mean, those are basically readers. What's the difference? And when you go to the Tune Book site, um, if you go check out Tune Books, you'll see there, um, some of theirs are also Geisel Award winners, even though they're comic books, or because they're comic books. Really makes you think, really makes you think. <laughs> so that's kind of our intro and also that kind of note about the Eisner Award. We'll talk about the Eisner Award again at the end, but even the fact that the Eisner added a category. When you look through the Eisners, you can see this is the year they added teen. This is the year they added elementary. This is the year they added easy readers. And that's because the field continues to expand and the field continues to expand because it continues to make readers. That's the success. And we are part of driving that. So. Let's look at some others. <laughs> okay, this is a brief aside. I don't talk a lot in this presentation about manga. For those of you that are not familiar, manga is Japanese-based comic books. Um, in Japan, everybody of all ages reads comic books. It's a, just like literally on the train, you see people reading comic books instead of reading newspapers. Um, so instead of manga, uh, I don't talk a lot about a manga in this, and that's because we're preparing a whole separate um, Pop YS uh, continuing ed class just on manga and anime. Um, so we're not gonna talk a lot about it in this class because we're gonna have a whole separate class on it, which is gonna be taught by one of my friends who is a, um, a librarian who's like an expert on this stuff. So, and we only had an hour for this one. So we're not gonna talk a lot about it, but I did have to mention uh, Fuku Fuku Kitten Tales by Konami Kantana. Um, this is the perfect all ages comic book. It is about, there's two volumes of this. It's about a cat who lives with a, an, uh, an elderly woman and it's told all from the point of view of the cat. So it's told from the cat's point of view about adjusting to living with this woman. It's super cute and adorable. It is a spinoff, Casey has mentioned, and it's true. It's a spinoff of Chai's Sweet Home, the single greatest all ages manga, which is all about cats and the cats talk and it's like the cutest thing ever. And it's also an amazing introduction to kid readers to the 
unbelievably huge genre of manga, which is a huge dominant cultural force. Um, and so we're not going to talk a lot about manga in this session because we're going to have a separate manga session. But in the meantime, I had to mention Fuku Fuku Kitten Tales. And this is also a reminder that this there's something in this for every age room, age group. Um, so um, if you are if you have never read Fuku Fuku and Cheese Sweet Home, I don't even I'm not even that into cats as some of you know. I'm not even that into cats, but I die. Uh, this is Pilu of the Woods by May K. Wen. Um, this, is a, this is a real example of kind of where we see so much of the genre heading right now. And this is about a girl named Pilu who gets into a fight with her sister and wanders into the woods where she meets a wood sprite. Um, and it really becomes a discussion. It really reminded me of a lot of things. One of the things that brought to my mind right away was... Um, the children's picture book when Sophie gets angry um, because there's so few picture books I think that deal so honestly with how deeply and quickly and hard kids feel and experience emotion and I really felt this from this too it really allows her the space of her emotions and at the same time it has this really cool like nature art and so it really combines some of the best things that we see in this format, which is the depth of feeling with also really beautiful and extraordinary visuals that, that pull kids in. So it has that I'm feeling my feelings, but also has, oh my gosh, look how cute and cool that is. So this is one of my favorites. Some of you have heard me talk about this before and it's because I love it. So this is Red Panda and Moon Bear by Jerry Rosello. It's the first in a series and it's about uh, two kids who become superheroes when they wear the right hoodies. As you can see from this picture, those are their hooded sweatshirts and that's what makes them superheroes. And they have adventures all through their neighborhood. Um, I think it's super cute. Um, and by superheroes, I mean they find that the best way to be a superhero is like helping out the people in their neighborhood, a message that I think is more relevant than ever now. Um, this is, there's gonna be a sequel to this one, yay. Um, and one of the things I like about this, I really like the art style. And one of the things I like about this too, the art style really reminds me of like Adventure Time um, and that kind of art style that a lot of kids are drawn to. Um, and it's also just really cute. And it's a lot about like things that you yourself can just do. And again, I, I really love their hoodies. Um, and I love how, you know, they put the hoodies on and then they're superheroes and it's super cute. So this is Red Panda and Moon Bear. Um, it's the first one. Okay, so this is, I wanted to talk about these three together because one of the things you heard me mention before was how we are seeing publishers responding to this. And some of them are responding amazing, and some of them are responding where you're like, pick it up. But for me, one of the most exciting things that we've seen is the development at DC of two specific imprints. And those imprints are called DC Inc. and DC Zoom. And DC Inc. is designed specifically to create teen YA um, high interest versions, reboots, and specific tellings of uh, DC characters. And DC Inc. was so popular that they started DC Zoom. And DC Zoom is for eight to 12 year olds. And I, every book that I've read from it, I've been obsessed with. Um, it's relatively new. And I, these are three DC Zoom titles. And I wanted to show them to you as an example. And I think that when we see Big comic publishers, especially those who have superhero properties, when we see them creating this kind of material, it's really exciting, along with the other stuff that, they, that we're looking at here, along with the independent stuff, along with the, the smaller press stuff. When we see big comic publishers with properties like this, creating material like this for this audience, it's really exciting. So these three are Batman Overdrive. Um, as you might guess from the title, this is about Bruce Wayne uh, figuring out how to build the Batmobile. Uh, as a teenager, kind of how he's figured out putting it together. So that view of him when he's not quite Batman. Um, and Green Lantern Legacy, uh, which is one of my favorite books of the year of any kind. Um, and it is about Green Lantern. And it's about a 12-year-old who inherits the Green Lantern ring from his Vietnamese grandmother, who was also a Green Lantern. I love it. I love the take on that your grandma could be Green Lantern. I love the take on that your grandma is Green Lantern because she does what's right for her community. Um, I love that interpretation of what a superhero is. Love it. And Diana, Princess of the Amazons by Shannon and Dean Hale. And um, this one I really love because it looks at what it would be like being Wonder Woman on the island when you're 12 years old and there's literally no other children there. Like, wouldn't you want to play with kids? 
Like, it would be cool that you were an Amazon, but like, wouldn't you want to play with kids? It feels like you would. So this is that, this is um, looking at her when she's 12 years old. And again, so looking at these, I, I, I didn't even cover all of them. There's so many more and they're so amazing. And that, well, at the bottom, DC Inc. and DC Zoom, that's a link to that, to the page where they list the titles and there's more coming. But I think it also tells us something about where the field is going. And I think that's a really exciting and important kind of, um, when we see that they're investing in it this way, this tells us something about what they think the future of comics are. And I love the idea that the future of comics are 12 year old girls and Vietnamese kids and dorks who like to fix cars. I love that that's, I love the idea that that's the future of comics. So um, these are just three, there's one about, uh, there's one about the Oracle coming out. There's one about Catwoman. Um, there's one about Miera, who's uh, Aquaman's girlfriend. And they're just, uh, there's one about Batgirl. Okay, I'm going to stop. But I think it's an exciting thing that tells us it's an investment. Yes, there's one about Santana. There's so many. I've, I have never read one that's bad. Um, honestly, I haven't read one from the line that I have been disappointed in. Um, so this is Cardboard Kingdom by Chad Sell. Is anybody familiar with this title? Has anybody, has anybody does anybody know this one? Um, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. So um, this is number one. There's a number two coming out. I want to use this one as a bridge. This is about a group of kids who discover a bunch of cardboard in their neighborhood and use it to become their truest selves. Um, they discover their own secret identities through it. Um, they get to be the person they want to do. One of the reasons I put it in here is because I love it. Um, and I also think that now, especially, it is a great book for your imagination. <laughs> So if you're looking for a book to talk about on your Facebook page or to talk about, it's a great book for having what you having what you have around you and using it for everything. I would recommend this book for ages 8 to 12. Um, so that's kind of the age range we're in right now. We're in the 8 to 12 right now. Um, but I would also recommend this for any age. <laughs> um, and one of the things I love in this is this, like a lot of graphic novels and even some of the ones we mentioned previously, um, is that it does a really great job. Um, for helping kids discuss and talk about their identities and what their identities can look like and mean. Um, and so one of the characters in this um, is experiencing like figuring out his sexuality and his gender. And he uses like the imaginative play of the cardboard kingdom and the free space to do that. Um, and it's integrated in the text in a way that is completely non-didactic, non uh, after school especially and it's just like this is a part of the story and I think that graphic novels especially do a really great job of that um, and uh, I, I think that they also do it in a way that's less like I'm teaching you a lesson and I'm shaking my finger at you and more like I'm helping you experience the world in a realistic way. And as far as I know, the title is the, for the sequel is still called Cardboard Kingdom 2 um, but I haven't heard anything. I haven't heard any updates about that. So. Um, this is an, related to that. So this is Sincerely Harriet by Sarah W. Searle. Um, this is one from a publisher. This is from an imprint called Graphic Universe from Learner Books. Um, if you're not familiar with them, it's an amazing, amazing graphic novel only imprint from Learner. And they have everything from nonfiction to um, this kind of story driven thing. And they're really upping the story driven kind of content. Um, they, in the past, they were the ones who did all the like adaptations. So like the graphic novel adaptation of the Telltale Heart or a graphic novel biography of Marie Curie. They really, because they worked in the school market, that was really what they only what they did. But now they're really expanding to this kind of market um, of narrative driven ones. And um, this one is Sincerely Harriet by Sarah W. Searle. This is about, I, I really loved this one. I read it in one sitting. And I, one of the things I really loved about this is the main character in this, uh, who's a, a I think she's 12 year old girl is dealing with the fact that she's been diagnosed with MS, uh, multiple scler sclerosis. And again, so just like Cardboard Kingdom, instead of being a book about like the special challenges of, oh my gosh, you have MS now, how do you deal with that? It's a story about how she deals with moving and how she deals with her anger about this and, and talking with her parents and her loneliness. Um, and, and also like, the ways that it changes her life and the way it changes her imagination. And it's 
in the graphic novel format, I think it's a little easier sometimes to approach the whole story. Um, and, and certainly that's been in the case, I certainly think that's the case in the best examples of these books. Um, and this one's really good. So um, sincerely, Harriet, uh, this is Sarah W. Searle. She's an online comic, uh, our online comic artist, but this I think is her debut um, in this chapter. And certainly if you have kids who love the Raina Telgemeier books, if you have kids who love the books about, um, you know, uh, the Sunny books by Jennifer Holmes, it's a really great read alike for them. And that's one of the things I think that's really important. So I've kind of alluded that, but to be more specific about it is um, I think that graphic novels, I think that all books, of course, we all think that all books, but I think that graphic novels especially are really great for starting conversations. So I mentioned earlier, and those of you that have heard me talk in the past have heard this before, I, I don't like the term struggling reader. Um, I think that everybody just needs to find the one book that they're meant to love. Um, so I don't like the term struggling reader. Emerging readers. Graphic novels are great for emerging readers because they open up conversations. Um, they open up conversations that it might be difficult or scary or overwhelming for kids to have. But the fact that they are told visually, um, the fact that they are so easy to pick up and just start reading, I think that that really opens up hard conversations or even conversations that are complicated or, or people might be unsure about having. So as an example, um, you know, I, I listed here, as those of you who've ever talked to me know, um, my favorite book of last year, which actually for a million, what are the million to one odds that your favorite book actually wins the Newberry, but this year it did, my favorite book of last year, The New Kid, New Kid by Jerry Craft. Um, which is about Jordan starting uh, a new school um, and everything he experiences that year and also it's told partially through his own comics that year. So I don't, I think that that's a universal story, right? I think that that is a story that every kid when you're starting middle school or when you're starting a new school, you have this. But what to me made New Kids stand out was the way that Jerry Craft took that universal story and also made it very specific to his own experience of being a black kid who was going to a predominantly white school. And I think that that book, this book is a great example of the truth that the more specific you make a story, the more universal it becomes, the more relatable it becomes. And so I think that New Kid, one of the things that's great about it, I think that it opens this conversation about what is it like to be a kid of color in a space that's mostly white? How do you reconcile the person you are in that space with the person you are at space and home? And at the same time, it does it in this way that is super relatable. There's, there's really easy to pull out moments in the text. I think that it starts conversations that a regular book would have a harder time getting to. Um, and so I think that's really important. And I think that's really powerful. Um, and as another example, so Raina Telgemeier's newest book um, is Guts. And it's about a lot of things, but it's also about her coming to grips with her really severe anxiety and how that anxiety manifests in her life and how that anxiety impacts how she hangs out with her friends and the food that she eats and even how she thinks of herself. And again, the, the honest, forthright way of talking about that I, I think that it's going to really help kids feel more seen, and it's also going to help kids have hard conversations. And that's partially because in the case of New Kid and Guts, those are both based on things that happened in Raina's and Jerry's childhood, because memoirs are especially popular here, okay? So memoirs, and I, I say this all the time, if you, had, if you told a person who didn't know anything about graphic novels, who didn't know anything about kids reading happen. If you told them, you know, uh, what kids are, what, uh, what kids, eight to 12 year old kids are most interested reading in uh, are biographies. They would laugh in your face and be like, oh, what they're most interested in reading is like Harry Potter or like that's what they're most interested in. But these are biographies, autobiographies, right? So like Smile is the story of Raina Telgemeier growing up. But if you framed it as, yeah, no, eight-year-olds love autobiographies about dental work. It's just, they're so popular. I cannot keep it on the shelf. I cannot keep this autobiography about an eight-year-old's dental troubles. They would, they would think you were a crazy person. They would think that was delusional. But it's true, right? So the biography section, you can't get to move. If you phrase it as that's what they love the most as memoirs, 
flying off the shelves, right? So the other thing they do, the Nathan Hale thing, and connected to all this, and we've kind of mentioned this before in the chat, this opens up the Nathan Tales Hazardous, Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales, which is marketed as NHHT, an NHHT thing, they're so popular. The Nathan Hale's um, Hazardous Tales are true stories from history told in graphic novel format, and often told as biographies. So the one that I chose at random was The Underground Abductor, which as you might be able to guess, is a biography of, this is where I would pause for audience reaction, Harriet Tubman, um, who now has gotten her second shout out today, uh, which is good, she can never get enough shout outs, of course. Um, so, but there's other ones, there's ones, I, I bought one for my nephew this uh, Christmas, that was all about World War I, and he's obsessed with it. So graphic novels also help kids get interested in subjects. I, 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 people laugh and I'm like, if you made a graphic novel, if Nathan Hale made a graphic novel about the Nixon Frost interviews, kids would be like, I love the Nixon Frost interviews. I've never been a bigger fan of the Nixon Frost interviews. I feel like they define our American democracy. <laughs> and that's powerful. That's so powerful. And I think that there's so much worth talking about how that happens, right? Like. So like, I, I, I think that like, and I'm, I'm not joking, people are always laughing like Nixon, and Frost, but that's a true story. If there was a great graphic novel about the Nixon and Frost debates, kids would be like, I personally, I, I couldn't be more into Nixon and Frost. It's a true thing. And I think that's really powerful. And I think that's something worth looking at and discussing how it affects the lives of the readers in our community. So with that in mind, Here's as we, we're going to move on now to kind of some more YA focused. So these are ones that I would recommend for ages like 13 and up. Although again, I think that this is all subjective. And as you all know, I think all books are for everybody. So, and that means adults too. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this. Um, I have to tell you that I, I didn't have super high uh, expectations of this because it's a book by a celebrity, but it definitely has been one of my favorite books that I have read this year in 2020. Um, so this is They Called Us, it was published last year, but I, I only read it this year. This is They Called Us Enemy by George Takai, who I'm sure most of you remember as uh, being one of the original members of Star Trek. Um, but if you are not familiar, when George Takai was a child, um, he and his family were interned during... Um, in internment prison camps during World War II. And this is his nonfiction memoir about his memories and experiences at that time and also how it impacted his family. Um, so it was written by him, George Takai, uh, with help and uh, coloring and drawing illustration from with Justin Enziger, Stephen Scott, and Harmony Becker. Um, it, it's truly extraordinary, and I, I know that you hear that thing where you're like, well, it's a historical book, but it's really about now. But I really felt like this was so immediate and so true, um, and it didn't read at all like historical fiction to me, although there's nothing wrong with historical fiction. Um, but it also really reminded me of the John Lewis books um, that are the, um, the March series, which um, are John Lewis's autobiography. It's super great, and I think the fact that he was younger uh, when this happened, and it's really filtered through a child's eyes and a child's mouth memory um, were really, uh, was really powerful to me. So this is They Called Us Enemy. So related. <laughs> um, so this, again, remember I told you a lot of publishers are really bulking up. This is from, this is one of the, one of the first titles from HarperCollins is starting their, HarperCollins has started their own graphic novel imprint called Harper Alley, A-L-L-E-Y. Harper Alley, and it's going to be all focused on graphic novels, and this is one of the first books from it. So this also is based on a true story. Um, it's based on the experiences of the narrator's mother during World War II. So this is Catherine's War by Julia Billette and Claire Favel. Um, I believe it was translated from the French, um, and it is about the uh, Catherine who is living during World War II as a hidden child. So if you're not familiar with that, what that is, it's um, Jewish children who had to pretend to be Christian um, to hide during World War II. And so the main character's mother, Ju Juliet Villette's mother um, uh, was a hidden child and Catherine in the book by this is, um, is a hidden child. And it talks about her experiences of having to um, it just immediately overnight go from being uh, Jewish to like the next morning being like you're not Jewish anymore and never talk about it again. Um, there's a panel in this book a lot of people talk about, you'll see, and I agree, it, it moved in my brain, which is um, the first time that she eats pork. Um, because, of course, she can't not eat pork anymore, because then it would give away that she's Jewish, and she really likes the way it tastes, um, but it's also really 
obviously conflicted and saddened by it. And this, I think, is an extraordinary use of the graphic novel format because through the illustrations, you can see all of that happening without having to write out, she felt like she liked the way the bacon tastes, but she felt bad because she was, you get all of that through the illustration. And I think that that is the perfect example of what we're talking about when we talk about how this builds literacies and it helps you understand story on a different level and it, and it changes you as a reader um, because you get to experience that without being somebody hitting you over the head of her eating this bacon. So it's really, really good. Um, and the power of authentic representation. That's right. The conversation that lets you have about what is that like for her? Of this feels really, if this tastes really good, but I also feel very sad. And so much of that without somebody pounding that story into your head. Um, and it's also really an exciting thing about what else is coming from Harper. Uh, so this is Almost American Girl. It came out literally like a week or two ago, I feel like. I just got it. So this is Almost American Girl by Robin Ha. Um, and this, again, if you have fans of Raina Telgemeier, if you have fans of those books that they want, uh, the Svetlana Chamovka awkward books, if you have fans of those books that want more stories, um, this is a semi this is a memoir based on when Robin Ha, who grew up with her mother, uh, only her and her mother in South Korea, they come um, to take a visit to Alabama, and her mother says, I'm getting married and we're staying here. And you're going to transition from living in South Korea with just me and you to going to public school in high school uh, here in America in Alabama. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> um, and it talks about like all the changes uh, that, that like, ha like, it's not just the change of like going from South Korea to going to Alabama, but like it was always me and my mom and now I have a stepdad and, and everything's changed and, and I, where do I fit in in all this? And again, that takes us back to those those conversations that we have about where do I fit, how do I fit in this. Um, this one's really good. I had been waiting for this and I, I purchased this one. So this is a little treat when it came to my house and it was really, it, it's really great. Okay, this is one I think is so great. So this is Fights, One Voice Triumph Over Violence by Joel Christian Gill. Um, and this too is a memoir. And it, one of the things I really like in this is he puts it as a frame story of him telling his son. So the, the author, Joel Christian Gill, telling his son about his experience and specifically telling his son about how like, yeah, I had a really crappy childhood and I got super into violence and fighting and just like everything you can imagine. And guess what? All that, that did was make my life worse. So just like my everything that happened, I kept escalating and making my life worse and worse. So now you have to ask yourself, what do you want to do with your life? I love and I love that frame story of it, and I I, I think for kids being able to experience, it, I think teen readers being able to experience it that way, I think it opens a lot of conversations. But Joel Christian Guild really does have a he really had a terrible upbringing. He was abused, you know. He his family structure was really all over the place, and and I think seeing that yet he was still able to to work through that and experience that and he's now telling this story to his son also lends this level of reassurance and again adds to the complexity of this work because you really get to experience it on these two levels of like how is his son going to react to hearing this about the guy you think is your boring old dad so uh, this one i think is i love joel christian gill and i um this is his first kind of memoir influence work that i'd read and i, I just really love it and i also think there's so much discussion in this and that's another thing i think everything we talked about graphic novels, it just really deepens that conversation. How, how many of you have read this? <laughs> this is Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me by Mariko Tamakai and illustrated colored by Rosemary uh, Valero O'Connell. <sighs> the perfect YA book, the perfect YA book. So this is about two girls in love, or are they? Um, and Laura Dean is like, she's like the perfect Frederica has, is in love with her. And she's like the perfect girlfriend, right? Oh, except she's crappy. And she keeps breaking up with Frederica. And I love everything about this story. But here's what I love the most about it. First of all, they're just, they're just gay together. They're just queer. There's no like, oh my gosh, this whole story is about like, oh my gay. <laughs> they're just gay. That's just the story. It's over. Let's keep going. I'm going to spoil a little bit of it for you. Basically, she comes up with, 
I just, they go to see a psychic, right? And the site, and she's like, psychic, how do I get, how do I make this stop? And her psychics, the psychic's like, you gotta just break up with her. And she's like, no, it has to be more complicated than that. And she's like, no, you, you just gotta let her stop treating you bad. And I love that a YA book was finally like, you just gotta stop letting people treat you bad. It's not a super complicated 800. You just, if somebody's mean to you and they're not a good boyfriend or girlfriend or partner, and they make you be crappy to your friends, just break up with them. That's the answer. There's no, like, you don't have to fight the hunger games. You don't have to, <laughs> you don't have to, like, go through therapy for the rest of your life. You just are like, you know what? We're not good together, and I like you, and I enjoyed being with you, but now we're broken up. I love it. I love it, and I love having that conversation through the lens, this lens. Um, it, it's also about how she is a crappy friend. She lets one of her friends down. Um, I, I think this is, I think this is an amazing YA novel, and it's a graphic novel. So again, the way that we look at format and what that format tells us, and what we expect from this format, and what we want to see from this format. By far one of my favorite books last year, Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. How do I solve it? <sighs> this place. Oh, so this is another thing we're going to see a lot of. And this, again, I think rep represents a trend that we're into um, and that we want to see more of, which is this, is, this is this place, 150 years retold. And you can see that I put by various authors. And that's because this is an anthology. This is a comics anthology. This is a lot of different writers and a lot of different artists combining to tell one unified story. And I think that's another thing we're going to be seeing a lot more of. And I think that's really great because as a reader, we all know that this gives you a chance to be like, that's the one I like. I'm into that. I'm into that style. I'm into that storytelling. I'm into that pacing. That's the one I like. I want to know more about that. So this is a Canadian publication, but I, I don't think that matters. <laughs> um, and it, here's what's extraordinary about it. It retells since the, since Canada, Canada became confederated in like 1837, I think, um, all of the different provinces, and it retells the history of Canada since that moment from an indigenous point of view. So when we retell the last 150 minute, 150 minute, 150 minutes, Sam, I just put this word. We retell the last 150 years. How does it look different when it's told from another point of view? And again, I think that is so much the strength of this format. It just opens up so many conversations to so many different creators. Um, and, and this is a wide anthology, so it's not one repeating story. You can get different points of view from different uh, creators in different eras for these 150 years. So I think this is a real what's next. And I'm super excited about that because as always, for those of you that know me, the thing I think we always need more and most of is to hear more from um, indigenous people of color. So this is one of my favorites. The reason I kept saying 150 minutes instead of 150 years is because Sam uh, wanted to let me know this is my eight minute warning. So this is our learn more. These are all live links. Again, the entire slide deck, along with all the slide decks for every other presenta presentation you go to, along with this being recorded, all of the slide decks will be shared at the State Library's website, so you don't have to worry about that. But these are some of my recommended resources. The ALA's Graphic Novel and Comics Roundtable, there's some webinars on there if you want to go to webinars. Um, uh, along with all kinds of, they're doing amazing things. They have a guide out they put out for COVID about how to share comics virtually and online. Um, Scholastic's Guide to Using Comics, I think it's amazing. It's a super place to start to develop your um, talking points. And also if you have administrators or if you have people who are reluctant, you have teachers, you have adults, the Scholastic Guide is super great. This is the Eisner Awards. We mentioned them before. Um, Good Comics for Kids, one of my favorite blogs. They also review like weekly comic issues, monthly comic issues, as well as graphic novels. So you can kind of keep abreast of what's being published there. Um, uh, Emily, all these books are already published, so none of these are advanced copies. Every one that I mentioned today is, is a book that's already out. Um, you, um, and the Yelsa's Great Graf Graphic Novel List, that's a list every year from the Young Adult Library Service Association. It's a compiled list of the great graphic novels published uh, the year before, and it also includes a lot of manga, um, as well as titles that are published for adults, just things that have high teen appeal, and it's a great reader's advisory list. So these are all live links, and I think that soon um, many of you might be working from home and looking for some things to do, and these are good. Um, again, 
all the slide decks will be published on the State Library website. So you will be able to click through as well as go through and write down ISBNs of anything you didn't get or so on and so forth. Um, your collection deserves comics and so do your readers. Um, make them easy to find. I know there is a lot of discussion and debate about this, but you should pull them out and make them their own collection. Um, nobody wants to go to the 7, 741s to find them. They, they do not want to do them. And also, I hope one of the things that you have at the very least picked up from this presentation is the genre has expanded enough that it's worth its own section. They don't all belong in 741 anyway. They, some should go in memoirs. There's ones about how to cook, where you put those in 600s. Um, you should pull them out and make their own collection. I know that that might be a more work, but this is a perfect time if you're working from home to look about ways that you can do that, to conceptualize how it might work. Um, even if you only have a shelf, um, even if you only have a little area, um, pulling them out, kids are drawn to them like magnets. Um, have a wide selection. That's one of the things I tried to spotlight here. Have a wide selection for a wide variety of readers. There is no one stereotypical comic reader. There's so many. Um, ask your kids what they want. Um, check what is your highest circulating. Um, ask, ask them what they're interested in. Um, I, I think that that kind of thing. I, um, you can interfile them if you don't have space, but I really, I'm a huge advocate and I would love to hear from other people in the chat in the couple of minutes we have. I'm a huge advocate of pulling them out. I think they warrant their own collection and I think having them their own collection also gives them an era of legitimacy. So I think if you say this is its own collection, that makes it legitimate in the eyes of your catalogers, in the eyes of your purchasing, you know, I, I think. Um, yeah. Um, yes. This is the best thing we ever did because next to do you know my email password, the next most asked question is where are your graphic novels? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The access, I think it really changes it and it gives it an air of legitimacy. Um, talk them up. Stand up for them. You know, you are the advocates for them. That's the other thing. But you, by you understanding the breadth and depth of this field and by you making those connections, like Mandy said, that if these books had existed when her husband was a kid, maybe he'd be a lifelong reader. By you making those connections, by you making that, talking them up and standing up for them really makes a difference. And I think pulling them out is a part of that too, because it says to your community, like we think these are worth just having the kids. We don't, they don't have to replace anything. They don't have to supplement anything. They're, they're worth. Um, when we de dewey ours, we put them up, CERC went over 60%. Um, yeah, I, I think with the nonfiction, you can just put them in with them. Um, or you can put them in at the beginning. Um, I think uh, you could, nonfiction them and then kind of put them in, but there's so many are memoirs right now. When I pulled them and put them all together, Cirques went up and kids were showing other kids where they were. Yes, ownership, ownership of collection, ownership. Um, we've kind of done the questions and comment part. How do you guys handle doing the nonfiction graphic novels? Um, uh, Yes, and if you, if none of you remember that sign from Andrea that I posted, it's on Library Talk, but it's this super cool, like, half-page flyer that's, like, why graphic novels are great, and it talks about, like, reader motivation, visual literacy, brain development. It's super great. I've seen it in tons of your libraries, and I love it, so um, I think that's a really great thing to have. We label them nonfiction, but add them to the end of the graphic novel collection. Um, yep, we keep, I, I think, weeding to make room for graphic novels. Um, yeah, uh, so many great, your nonfiction are just at the end. Yeah, so um, that seems to be kind of the, you can put it at the end or the beginning. Um, so believe it or not, we have come to the end of our time together. I know we could do, that's why I said this is only the beginning. I could do this, we could go on and on and on. Um, so if this is my contact information. I put a rainbow, um, I think, I put a rainbow to remind you that this is going to keep going. Um, there's going to be a rainbow. Uh, that's the symbol they're using in the UK. They're putting up rainbows in their windows. Um, and I love that. Uh, so, yes, if you love the, this session, send me some kid first suggestions. Um, how do you determine what something is a graphic novel? There is no answer to that. Um, <laughs> We do not know. Uh, no, uh, you can tell in a variety of ways. The author doesn't get to determine it, though. You get to make the last decision. 